be good. We're getting close, though. <laughs> We're getting close. Uh, it's good to see you this morning. I'm so, so thankful that you are here. Uh, I hope that you continue to keep our shepherds in uh, your prayers and the one uh, that we will add as a new shepherd. We don't know who that is yet, but the process is, is underway and we're thankful for that. Uh, but keep them and their families in your prayer. Who are you? Who are you? There's a lot of ways that we can answer that. Now, I might would say... I'm a dad, I'm a husband, I'm a brother, I'm a friend. Uh, you might would say, I'm a mom, I'm a wife, I'm a grandmother, a grandma. There's lots of ways we could do that. Answer that question. You could say, I'm, a, I'm an engineer, I'm a lawyer, I'm an accountant, I'm a school teacher, I'm a nurse, I'm a veteran. You know, we could fill in the blank over and over and over. You could say things like, you know, I'm a starter on the, uh, the football team or the basketball team or the volleyball team. You say, I'm, a, I'm an A student. I'm an AB student. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of ways that we can answer that question. There's a lot of things that we find our identity in that define us, that give us value, that give us worth. You could say, well, I'm, a, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm a small business owner. I'm a, a, you know, a high-level executive. I'm a success. I'm a failure. You might even say, well, I don't know who I am. I feel like I'm a nobody. You might be confused about who you are and, and if you have meaning and worth and purpose. But you think about who, who are you? You say, I am. We can fill it in with so many different things. There's so many different things in our lives individually that we choose to allow to define us and give us purpose and give us meaning and give us value. Your identity, who you are, it's complex when you think about it. Because who you are is is because of so many different things in your life, different influences, different people who have been a part of your life and the things that they've told you about yourself or haven't told you about yourself, the ways they've encouraged you or haven't encouraged you. Uh, you know, the, the, who you are is, is based on life decisions that you have made, whether they are good or whether they are bad. They, they help define who you are and, and who you are uh, this, even this morning. There's so many things in your life, even circumstances beyond and outside your control define some of who you are. That may not seem like it's fair, but, but part of who you are is based on things outside of, of your control and your choice. Who are you? Well, 26 verses into the Bible, God tells you who you are. He says, you are the image of God. It seems pretty simple, right? And I want, I want you to say it with me. I want you to say it with me. I am the image of God. You ready? I am the image of God. 26 verses into the Bible, God does not leave you wondering who you are. Matter of fact, the first time he talks about humans, he tells you who you are. He doesn't leave you wondering. You are the image of God. And that spiritual reality and truth gives your life intrinsic value and meaning and purpose. If you don't know who you are, or you're confused about who you are, or you're confused if your life has value and meaning and purpose, let me tell you it does because God created you in his image. And you are somebody because of that. When your identity is found in a subjective, fluid, abstract, ever-changing construct and not grounded in the absolute truth that you are the image of God, you are chasing a lie. You're chasing a lie. To use the, script, the, the Spirit's language, if you will embrace who God says that you are, 
you will not be tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. And that's exactly what's going on today. People are chasing after crafty, deceitful scheming. And they're believing it as truth. But it's a lie. In other words, if, if you will conform to what the world says is popular or trendy or what they think you ought to be right now, when that changes, because it will, when that changes, who will you be? I'll tell you who you'll be. You'll chase after the next lie that the world says you ought to be. And you'll keep chasing that because it's ever-changing. It's fluid. That Whatever they say is cool today is going to be different and uncool tomorrow. And you're going to be chasing lie after lie after lie. And so this morning, we're going to start a new series, I Am Who You Say I Am, My Identity in Christ. For the next four Sundays, I know there's five, but the fifth one, we'll be out of town in Harding visiting our daughter uh, but for the next four Sundays, we're going to look at what Scripture has to say about my identity in Christ. Who does God say that I am? Because that's all that matters. It doesn't matter what other people say I am. It doesn't matter what other people think I am. It doesn't matter what other people try to push on me. It does to an extent, I get that. But all that really matters is that I embrace who God says I am. And Scripture is not unclear about who I am. Jesus is very clear about who you are in Him. And so this morning, we're going to look at the fact, the spiritual truth, that we are the image of God. All of humanity is created in the likeness of God. Every single person. Every person. Before Adam was a husband, before Adam was a father, he was the image of God. And the same goes for Eve. After when God made her and before uh, God presented Eve to Adam as, her, uh, as his wife, and before she became a mom, you know who she was? The image of God. All of us share that identity. Every single one of us is either a man or a woman created in the image of God. That's who we are. What does it mean? What does it mean to be created in the image of God? What does it mean to bear the likeness of God? What does it mean to be an image bearer of the creator? Well, I'm glad you asked that because that's what we're going to talk about this morning. But we're going to switch gears for just a little bit. We're going to go at it a little bit different angle, I think, to help us to give a little bit of, of understanding of what it means to be the image of God. If we lived, you're going to have to use your mind, think back a thousands and thousands of years, if we lived during ancient Bible times, there's a good chance that you and I would live under the rule and the authority of a king. And many of these ancient kings, they claimed, they thought they were gods, and they even called themselves the image of God. And these kings had authority to tell people what to do. And the king told you to do something, guess what you did? You did what they told you to do. And they had the authority to, to define good and evil within their kingdoms. And since these kings couldn't be everywhere in their kingdom at once, and all over the kingdom maybe as they would like to be, they would build monuments or statues of themselves throughout the kingdom. And these images, these images of themselves let everyone know where the king's rule and authority extended to, because that was their kingdom. This was a, a widespread practice among the Egyptian and even uh, the Mesopotamian kings. And believe it or not, it's a practice still followed today. Let me give an example. Buckingham Palace announced Tuesday that the United Kingdom will gradually be, begin to see coins and banknotes and stamps bearing the image of, can you guess, King Charles III. You know what that is? That's a show of rule and power and authority of his kingship. 
And he wants his image to extend all throughout his kingdom. He wants people to know who is their king. These statues or these images that these kings would set up help us understand what it means to be created in the image of God. If you have your Bibles, open to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1, 26 through 28, that was just read a minute ago. In the creation account, God is, is depicted as having all power and authority. And when he speaks, things happen. That's how much power and authority that God has. When he speaks something into creation, it appears. It creates. That's the power and the authority and the rule that God has as king. We see that he brings order and beauty out of chaos and darkness in the beginning. And so let's read. On day six, here's what God says. Then God said, let us make man, that is humanity. He's not speaking just of uh, male. He said, let's make humanity in our image, after our likeness. And let them have dominion. Notice the, the words that are in bold on the screen, or you can read them in, in your Bible. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man, humanity, in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. He created them. Verse 28. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Verses 26 and 28 are almost uh, the exact same wording. And so you'll notice what it means to be created in the image of God. I think these three verses give us a great idea and understanding of what it means to be created in the image of God. And there's three words that are used. The first, the, the word dominion, it's used in verse 26 and 28. And it means to have rule or to dominate. And then we see the word subdue. And, and it's, it's the idea, this, this subduing the earth, it's the idea of working the earth and, and then making the earth work for you in your favor. And so Adam and Eve were to, to work the earth, to garden, and, and as they did, the, the plants and the trees grow and bore fruit, and they were able to, to pick and eat from that. And then there's be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. The idea is that through humanity, God would fill the earth with his goodness. And Adam and Eve did that to an extent. And so the image of God describes our God-given task as humans, his official representatives, his official images to feel, rule, and subdue the earth with his goodness. Our, our function to the rest, relative to the rest of creation is to subdue and rule the earth. No other creation or part of creation was given this royal task. To have dominion and to subdue the earth and to fill it. Adam and Eve were given authority by God to share in God's rule of the earth and his resources and creatures. But the power and the authority conferred to them by God was corrupted by an abuse of that authority given them. As God says, do this. Uh, they, they took that and eventually, we don't know, the Bible timeline doesn't tell us, but they eventually used that authority and corrupt things. God, we know, gave Adam and Eve a choice about how he could, they could rule the earth. They could take his definition of good and evil and they could rule the earth and subdue it that way and fill the world, the earth, with his goodness. Or they could define good and evil on their own terms. And use the authority given to them for themselves. And we know we don't, we probably in your Bible, you just got to flip the page. And you see, you come to Genesis chapter 3 and you know exactly what happens. They choose power for themselves. They abuse the authority and the rule that God gave them for themselves. And they corrupt the world. Instead of spreading his goodness, they corrupt the world. And sin begins to spread. An abuse of power, an abuse of authority begin 
to fill the earth. It's not much song you see that, that Cain kills Abel and then Lamech kills a man. And then we come to the story of the flood and all of the earth is corrupt. Evil was on the heart and the mind of man continually. So we see instead of filling the earth with God's goodness and allowing him to define good and evil, they corrupt it. It's a little ironic that this happens when they, because they choose to be like God. It's a little ironic when you think about it. Because you go, you flip forward a, a little bit, you go to Exodus chapter 20, when God gives the Ten Commandments, this is what he says. Number two, you shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the uh, water under the earth. Why does God tell his people not to make any carved images? Well, there's at least two reasons. Number one, there's no way that you can reduce the creator to any one thing in creation. Number two, we aren't supposed to make images of God because God has already made images of himself. Think about it. God has already filled the earth with images of himself. You and I are created in the image of God. When I look at you and you look at me, what do you see? You see someone who's been created in the image of God who has intrinsic value. Adam and Eve, they were already like God. They, they were already like God. They were perfectly good. We see that at the end of creation, everything was good. They shared in his goodness. They were good. They were perfectly good. And, and they were given by God authority to go into the, the world and, and, and rule and have dominion over it and fill the world. But they failed. Thankfully, the Bible story doesn't end there. We come to the New Testament and Jesus reclaims the image of God for us. The Bible story continues and makes the claim that our abuse of authority is resolved when God bound himself to humanity in the man Jesus. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only son from the father full of grace and truth. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, Colossians 1 and verse 15. And we turn to Hebrews. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. The man Jesus shows us what it's truly like to be human. Jesus ruled. When he came into the world, he ruled by God's definition of goodness. Mark chapter 10, verse 42, Jesus says, He calls them to Him and He said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. This is the way the world rules. I'm going to exercise authority over you. I'm going to make you do what I want you to do. This is what Adam and Eve grabbed for. This is the power that, that they wanted. It's an abuse of power, an abuse of authority. But Jesus keeps talking. He says, but it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. This is how real God-given authority is is exercised. Jesus ruled through humble service and sacrifice. He not only treated his friends this way, but he treated his enemies this way as well. And he calls you and I to do exactly the same. Through his service to God and his service to others, he allowed the evil and the corruption that came in the world through abuse of power to kill him. And through his resurrection, Jesus redeems for us the image of God that Adam corrupted and he creates a new humanity 
conformed to his image. In this new humanity, it is open to all, but the door is through the resurrected Messiah. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is new creation. The old is passed away, and behold, the new has come. Look at Ephesians chapter 4 with me. <clears throat> Ephesians 4, we're going to start in verse 22. It kind of starts in the middle of a thought. I understand that, but you'll get the idea. Well, let's start in verse 20. Ephesians 4. And Paul says, But that is not the way you learned Christ, assuming that you have heard about him, and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. Bold claim there. To put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self. This is the new man, the new humanity. Look at this. Created after the likeness of God and true righteousness and holiness. This is what Jesus has done for us. He's reclaimed the image of God that we have corrupted through an abuse of power and authority. He says in uh, John writes, John 1 and verse 12, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become, here's this new human, this new creature, children of God. Through Jesus, we have the right to become children of God, to become new creation to have the corruption and the evil and the sinful desires that come with our abuse of power and authority washed away to become humble servants spreading the goodness of God as children of God Jesus takes the image of God in Genesis, Genesis 1 and he redeems it and he gives it richer meaning look at Matthew 28 Matthew 28, we come to the end of Matthew's gospel. Jesus has been crucified. He was buried. He's resurrected. And now as the resurrected Jesus, he's talking to uh, the twelve and he's, he's speaking to them. And let's read verses 18 through 20. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. It's interesting. I've been studying this this week, the parallels. In Genesis 1, you see God as a royal king, speaking and things happen. He's creating. And he tells that man and the woman go into the world and subdue it and have dominion over it and be fruitful and multiply. Take my goodness into the world and cover it. And now we come to the resurrected Jesus before he ascends in the world. There's a parallel here. He says, I have all authority in heaven and on earth. I want you to go into the world and I want you to have dominion over it and I want you to subdue it. I know those words aren't there, but the concept is, but here's how you do it. You take the gospel and the good news and you teach and you grow the kingdom so that it fills the world. Because as the image of God, as the image, recreating the image of Jesus, where I go, the royal power of Jesus is there. His kingdom is there. Because we take the gospel into the world. Jesus is king. And he says, teach the gospel and make disciples who are recreated in his image as we go into the world reclaiming it for the cause of Christ. In making disciples, we are using our Christ-given authority as being recreated in his image to fill the earth with God's kingdom. Where the Spirit of God rules in us through love, joy, and Peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That's how we take the kingdom, 
the good news and grow the kingdom in the world. Jesus doesn't rule through force. He rules through humble service. As we read the rest of the New Testament, it is concerned with how we embody the image of Jesus and live a life of love and servanthood and sacrifice. That's how we now subdue the earth with the kingdom of God. Who are you? Although you may be a dad or a mom, a husband, a wife, fill in the blank. You are a child of God. And because of the finished work of Jesus on the, cross, on the cross, you have been recreated in His image to go and subdue the earth through serving others and loving them, whether they're your friends or they're your enemies. Because you want them, just like you, to become new creation, recreated in the image of Christ. If your identity isn't grounded in the truth of who God says you are, you are believing the devil's lies. And Jesus says he's the father of all lies. John 8 and verse 44. I'm going to tell you something. He hates God. He hates the truth. And he hates you. His lies about you, on who he thinks or who he's trying to tell you that you should be and you should find your worth in, they will leave you feeling abandoned and hollow and spiritually dead. And I'm convinced that most people who are on a quest for truth concerning their identity are not on a quest for truth. They are on a quest for momentary happiness and it will constantly elude them. And it will eventually lead to destruction. If you are struggling with who you are, I want you to know, I want you to know this. You have been created in the image of God. You are an image bearer of the Creator. And because of the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, if you're not yet a child of God, you can be born again. And become new creation. And become His and bear His image. And you can do that this morning. By repenting of your sins. Being immersed into Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins and the waters of baptism. Raised to walk and live a life. Immersed in Jesus. Bearing His image. Making disciples as you go into the world and reclaim it for the cause of Christ. That's who you are. In Jesus. If you're already a child of God, and maybe you've been listening to the lies of the world, maybe you're confused about who you are and His plan for you and what He wants you to do, we would love to talk with you and study with you and pray with you and open up God's truth and show you who you are in Jesus. Whatever your need is this morning, please come forward and make it known while we stand and while we sing.